Have you ever been on an emotional roller coaster? Your mood swinging from the peak of exhilaration to the depths of despair, all in the blink of an eye? What if I told you there's a way off that ride, a path to mastering your emotions and discovering authentic joy? What if this ancient wisdom, laid out by a Roman philosopher almost 2,000 years ago, could radically alter your perspective on life right now? Stick around, because we're diving into Seneca's lesser-known letters that hold the secrets to mastering your emotions and finding joy in the everyday. If you've been with us for the first part of this series on Seneca's transformative letters, you already know that these documents are more than just ink on paper. They are the whispers of wisdom that have transcended time and space, crossing the millennia to arrive in our digital age. The first video was a journey through seven of Seneca's most impactful letters, dealing with themes like resilience, personal growth, and human relationships. We talked about becoming invincible, not in the sense of some superhero power, but as a state of mind that equips you to navigate life's challenges with grace and wisdom. In today's video, we're pivoting slightly but significantly. We're focusing on the themes of emotional mastery and the quest for genuine everyday joy. Now you might be thinking, emotions, joy? That's the stuff of self-help books and motivational speakers, not ancient philosophy. But bear with me. Seneca's approach to these universally relevant topics is not only unique, but stunningly applicable, even in the 21st century. So why emotional mastery? Well, if you think about it, emotions pretty much run the show. They dictate how you respond to life's challenges, how you interact with other people, and even how you view yourself. The Stoic philosophy epitomized by Seneca provides practical tools for mastering these capricious elements of our human experience. And in doing so, Stoicism opens the door to a more enduring internal form of joy, untouched by external circumstances. And about joy, a term we often throw around loosely, what do we mean? We're not talking about transient happiness that comes from external validation or material possession. We're talking about an internal, deeply rooted joy that serves as a stable foundation for a fulfilling life. We're talking about the kind of joy that doesn't flutter away when things go awry. The kind of joy that even Seneca, a man who lived through political exile and faced execution, could tap into and express in his profound letters. In today's video, we will dissect five specific letters where Seneca lays bare his secrets on controlling our emotional selves and finding that elusive, persistent joy. He tackles this grand endeavor from various angles, from the merits of philosophical reflection as a source of joy to the importance of self-control, moderation, and courage. By the end of this video, we will have built a comprehensive roadmap informed by Seneca to master our emotional landscape and draw joy from the well of everyday life. You might be wondering, are Seneca's letters the ultimate handbook for life? Well, they are a part of a mosaic of wisdom traditions that have enriched human history. However, the unique appeal of these letters lies in their balance of philosophical depth and practical advice. Seneca doesn't just offer grand theories, he boils them down to actionable steps. Steps that each one of us can implement starting today. So get comfortable, grab your notepad or your tablet, and prepare for another deep dive into the stoic wisdom of Seneca. This isn't just a foray into ancient history, it's a quest for a timeless way of living. It's a promise that even amidst the chaos and uncertainty that life often throws our way, we can find grounding, resilience, and yes, joy. Letter 8 on the philosopher's seclusion. Do you bid me, you say, shun the throng and withdraw from men and be content with my own conscience? Where are the counsels of your school which order a man to die in the midst of active work? As to the course which I seem to you to be urging on you now and then, my object in shutting myself up and locking the door is to be able to help a greater number. I never spend a day in idleness. I appropriate even a part of the night for study. I do not allow time for sleep but yield to it when I must. 
and when my eyes are wearied with waking and ready to fall shut, I keep them at their task. I have withdrawn not only from men, but from affairs, especially from my own affairs. I am working for later generations, writing down some ideas that may be of assistance to them. There are certain wholesome counsels, which may be compared to prescriptions of useful drugs. These I am putting into writing, for I have found them helpful in ministering to my own sores, which, if not wholly cured, have at any rate ceased to spread. I point other men to the right path, which I have found late in life when wearied with wandering. I cry out to them, avoid whatever pleases the throng, avoid the gifts of chance, halt before every good which chance brings to you in a spirit of doubt and fear, for it is the dumb animals and fish that are deceived by tempting hopes. Do you call these things the gifts of fortune? They are snares, and any man among you who wishes to live a life of safety will avoid, to the utmost of his power, these limed twigs of her favor, by which we mortals, most wretched in this respect also, are deceived, for we think that we hold them in our grasp, but they hold us in theirs. Such a career leads us into precipitous ways, and life on such heights ends in a fall. Moreover, we cannot even stand up against prosperity when she begins to drive us to leeward, nor can we go down either, with the ship at least on her course, or once for all. Fortune does not capsize us, she plunges our bows under and dashes us on the rocks. Hold fast then to this sound and wholesome rule of life, that you indulge the body only so far as is needful for good health. The body should be treated more rigorously, that it may not be disobedient to the mind. Eat merely to relieve your hunger. Drink merely to quench your thirst. Dress merely to keep out the cold. House yourself merely as a protection against personal discomfort. It matters little whether the house be built of turf or of variously colored imported marble. Understand that a man is sheltered just as well by a thatch as by a roof of gold. Despise everything that useless toil creates as an ornament and an object of beauty. And reflect that nothing except the soul is worthy of wonder. For to the soul, if it be great, naught is great. When I commune in such terms with myself and with future generations, do you not think that I am doing more good than when I appear as counsel in court, or stamp my seal upon a will, or lend my assistance in the Senate by word or action to a candidate? Believe me, those who seem to be busied with nothing are busied with the greater tasks. They are dealing at the same time with things mortal and things immortal. But I must stop and pay my customary contribution to balance this letter. The payment shall not be made from my own property, for I am still conning Epicurus. I read today in his works the following sentence. If you would enjoy real freedom, you must be the slave of philosophy. The man who submits and surrenders himself to her is not kept waiting. He is emancipated on the spot. For the very service of philosophy is freedom. It is likely that you will ask me why I quote so many of Epicurus's noble words instead of words taken from our own school. But is there any reason why you should regard them as sayings of Epicurus and not common property? How many poets give forth ideas that have been uttered or may be uttered by philosophers? I need not touch upon the tragedians and our writers of national drama, for these last are also somewhat serious and stand halfway between comedy and tragedy. What a quantity of sagacious verses lie buried in the mime. How many of Publilius's lines are worthy of being spoken by buskin-clad actors, as well as by wearers of the slipper? I shall quote one verse of his which concerns philosophy and particularly that phase of it which we were discussing a moment ago, wherein he says that the gifts of chance are not to be regarded as part of our possessions, still alien is whatever you have gained by coveting. I recall that you yourself expressed this idea much more happily and concisely. What chance has made yours is not really yours, and the third, spoken by you still more happily, shall not be omitted. The good that could be given can be removed. I shall not charge this up to the expense account, because I have given it to you from your own stock. Letter 23. On the true joy which comes from philosophy. 
Do you suppose that I shall write you how kindly the winter season has dealt with us? A short season and a mild one? Or what a nasty spring we are having? Cold weather out of season? And all the other trivialities which people write when they are at a loss for topics of conversation? No, I shall communicate something which may help both you and myself. And what shall this something be if not an exhortation to soundness of mind? Do you ask what is the foundation of a sound mind? It is not to find joy in useless things. I said that it was the foundation, it is really the pinnacle. We have reached the heights if we know what it is that we find joy in and if we have not placed our happiness in the control of externals. The man who is goaded ahead by hope of anything, though it be within reach, though it be easy of access and though his ambitions have never played him false, is troubled and unsure of himself. Above all, my dear Lucilius, make this your business, learn how to feel joy. Do you think that I am now robbing you of many pleasures when I try to do away with the gifts of chance, when I counsel the avoidance of hope, the sweetest thing that gladdens our hearts? Quite the contrary, I do not wish you ever to be deprived of gladness. I would have it born in your house, and it is born there if only it be inside of you. Other objects of cheer do not fill a man's bosom, they merely smooth his brow and are inconstant, unless perhaps you believe that he who laughs has joy. The very soul must be happy and confident, lifted above every circumstance. Real joy, believe me, is a stern matter. Can one, do you think, despise death with a carefree countenance, or with a blithe and gay expression, as our young dandies are accustomed to say? Or can one thus open his door to poverty, or hold the curb on his pleasures, or contemplate the endurance of pain? He who ponders these things in his heart is indeed full of joy, but it is not a cheerful joy. It is just this joy, however, of which I would have you become the owner, for it will never fail you when once you have found its source. The yield of poor minds is on the surface, those are really rich whose veins lurk deep, and they will make more bountiful returns to him who delves unceasingly. So too those baubles which delight the common crowd afford but a thin pleasure, laid on as a coating, and even joy that is only plated lacks a real basis. But the joy of which I speak, that to which I am endeavoring to lead you, is something solid, disclosing itself the more fully as you penetrate into it. Therefore, I pray you, my dearest Lucilius, do the one thing that can render you really happy. Cast aside and trample underfoot all the things that glitter outwardly and are held out to you by another or as obtainable from another. Look toward the true good and rejoice only in that which comes from your own store. And what do I mean by from your own store? I mean from your very self, that which is the best part of you. The frail body also, even though we can accomplish nothing without it, is to be regarded as necessary rather than as important. It involves us in vain pleasures, short-lived and soon to be regretted, which unless they are reined in by extreme self-control, will be transformed into the opposite. This is what I mean. Pleasure, unless it has been kept within bounds, tends to rush headlong into the abyss of sorrow. But it is hard to keep within bounds in that which you believe to be good. The real good may be coveted with safety, do you ask me what this real good is and whence it derives? I will tell you, it comes from a good conscience, from honorable purposes, from right actions, from contempt of the gifts of chance, from an even and calm way of living which treads but one path. For men who leap from one purpose to another, or do not even leap but are carried over by a sort of hazard, how can such wavering and unstable persons possess any good that is fixed and lasting? There are only a few who control themselves and their affairs by a guiding purpose. The rest do not proceed. They are merely swept along like objects afloat in a river. And of these objects, some are held back by sluggish waters and are transported gently. Others are torn along by a more violent current. Some which are nearest the bank are left there as the current slackens and others are carried out to sea by the onrush of the stream. Therefore we should decide what we wish and abide by the decision. Now is the time for me to pay my debt. I can give you a saying of your friend Epicurus and thus clear this letter of its obligation. It is bothersome always to be beginning life. Or another, which will perhaps express the meaning better. They live ill who are always beginning to live. You are right in asking why, 
the saying certainly stands in need of a commentary. It is because the life of such persons is always incomplete. But a man cannot stand prepared for the approach of death if he has just begun to live. We must make it our aim already to have lived long enough. No one deems that he has done so if he is just on the point of planning his life. You need not think that there are few of this kind. Practically everyone is of such a stamp. Some men indeed only begin to live when it is time for them to leave off living. And if this seems surprising to you, I shall add that which will surprise you still more. Some men have left off living before they have begun. Letter 36. On the value of retirement. Encourage your friend to despise stout-heartedly those who upbraid him because he has sought the shade of retirement and has abdicated his career of honors and, though he might have attained more, has preferred tranquility to them all. Let him prove daily to these detractors how wisely he has looked out for his own interests. Those whom men envy will continue to march past him, some will be pushed out of the ranks and others will fall. Prosperity is a turbulent thing. It torments itself. It stirs the brain in more ways than one, goading men on to various aims, some to power and others to high living. Some it puffs up, others it slackens and wholly enervates. But, the retort comes, so and so carries his prosperity well. Yes, just as he carries his liquor. So you need not let this class of men persuade you that one who is besieged by the crowd is happy. They run to him as crowds rush for a pool of water, rendering it muddy while they drain it. But you say, men call our friend a trifler and a sluggard. There are men you know whose speech is awry who use the contrary terms. They called him happy. What of it? Was he happy? Even the fact that to certain persons he seems a man of a very rough and gloomy cast of mind does not trouble me. Aristo used to say that he preferred a youth of stern disposition to one who was a jolly fellow and agreeable to the crowd. For, he added, wine which when new seemed harsh and sour becomes good wine, but that which tasted well at the vintage cannot stand age. So let them call him stern and a foe to his own advancement. It is just this sternness that will go well when it is aged, provided only that he continues to cherish virtue and to absorb thoroughly the studies which make for culture not those with which it is sufficient for a man to sprinkle himself, but those in which the mind should be steeped. Now is the time to learn. What? Is there any time when a man should not learn? By no means, but just as it is creditable for every age to study, so it is not creditable for every age to be instructed. An old man learning his ABC is a disgraceful and absurd object. The young man must store up, the old man must use. You will therefore be doing a thing most helpful to yourself if you make this friend of yours as good a man as possible. Those kindnesses, they tell us, are to be both sought for and bestowed, which benefit the giver no less than the receiver, and they are unquestionably the best kind. Finally, he has no longer any freedom in the matter. He has pledged his word, and it is less disgraceful to compound with a creditor than to compound with a promising future. To pay his debt of money, the businessman must have a prosperous voyage, the farmer must have fruitful fields and kindly weather, but the debt which your friend owes can be completely paid by mere goodwill. Fortune has no jurisdiction over character. Let him so regulate his character that in perfect peace he may bring to perfection that spirit within him which feels neither loss nor gain, but remains in the same attitude, no matter how things fall out. A spirit like this, if it is heaped with worldly goods, rises superior to its wealth. If, on the other hand, chance has stripped him of a part of his wealth, or even all, it is not impaired. If your friend had been born in Parthia, he would have begun, when a child, to bend the bow. If in Germany, he would forthwith have been brandishing his slender spear. If he had been born in the days of our forefathers, he would have learned to ride a horse and smite his enemy hand to hand. These are the occupations which the system of each race recommends to the individual, yes, prescribes for him. To what then shall this friend of yours devote his attention? 
I say let him learn that which is helpful against all weapons, against every kind of foe, contempt of death, because no one doubts that death has in it something that inspires terror, so that it shocks even our souls, which nature has so molded that they love their own existence. For otherwise, there would be no need to prepare ourselves, and to whet our courage, to face that towards which we should move with a sort of voluntary instinct, precisely as all men tend to preserve their existence. No man learns a thing in order that, if necessity arises, he may lie down with composure upon a bed of roses. But he steals his courage to this end, that he may not surrender his plighted faith to torture, and that, if need be, he may some day stay out his watch in the trenches, even though wounded, without even leaning on his spear, because sleep is likely to creep over men who support themselves by any prop whatsoever. In death there is nothing harmful, for there must exist something to which it is harmful. And yet, if you are possessed by so great a craving for a longer life, reflect that none of the objects which vanish from our gaze and are reabsorbed into the world of things from which they have come forth and are soon to come forth again is annihilated. They merely end their course and do not perish. And death which we fear and shrink from merely interrupts life but does not steal it away. The time will return when we shall be restored to the light of day. And many men would object to this were they not brought back in forgetfulness of the past. But I mean to show you later with more care that everything which seems to perish merely changes. Since you are destined to return, you ought to depart with a tranquil mind. Mark how the round of the universe repeats its course. You will see that no star in our firmament is extinguished, but that they all set and rise in alternation. Summer has gone, but another year will bring it again. Winter lies low, but will be restored by its own proper months. Night has overwhelmed the sun, but day will soon rout the night again. The wandering stars retrace their former courses. A part of the sky is rising unceasingly, and a part is sinking. One word more, and then I shall stop. Infants and boys and those who have gone mad have no fear of death and it is most shameful if reason cannot afford us that peace of mind to which they have been brought by their folly. Letter 83 on Drunkenness you bid me give you an account of each separate day, and of the whole day too, so you must have a good opinion of me if you think that in these days of mine there is nothing to hide. At any rate, it is thus that we should live, as if we lived in plain sight of all men, and it is thus that we should think, as if there were someone who could look into our inmost souls, and there is one who can so look, for what avails it that something is hidden from man? Nothing is shut off from the sight of God. He is witness of our souls, and he comes into the very midst of our thoughts, comes into them, I say, as one who may at any time depart. I shall therefore do as you bid, and shall gladly inform you by letter what I am doing, and in what sequence. I shall keep watching myself continually, and a most useful habit shall review each day. For this is what makes us wicked, that no one of us looks back over his own life. Our thoughts are devoted only to what we are about to do. And yet our plans for the future always depend on the past. Today has been unbroken. No one has filched the slightest part of it from me. The whole time has been divided between rest and reading. A brief space has been given over to bodily exercise, and on this ground I can thank old age. My exercise costs very little effort. As soon as I stir, I am tired. And weariness is the aim and end of exercise, no matter how strong one is. Do you ask who are my pacemakers? One is enough for me, the slave Farius, a pleasant fellow as you know, but I shall exchange him for another. At my time of life I need one who is of still more tender years. Farius at any rate says that he and I are at the same period of life, for we are both losing our teeth. Yet even now I can scarcely follow his pace as he runs, and within a very short time I shall not be able to follow him at all, so you see what profit we get from daily exercise. Very soon does a wide interval open between two persons who travel different ways. My slave is climbing up at the very moment when I am coming down, and you surely know how much quicker the latter is. Nay, I was wrong, for now my life is not coming down, 
it is falling outright. Do you ask for all that, how our race resulted today? We raced to a tie, something which rarely happens in a running contest. After tiring myself out in this way, for I cannot call it exercise, I took a cold bath. This at my house means just short of hot. I, the former cold water enthusiast, who used to celebrate the new year by taking a plunge into the canal, who just as naturally as I would set out to do some reading or writing or to compose a speech, used to inaugurate the first of the year with a plunge into the Virgo aqueduct, have changed my allegiance, first to the Tiber and then to my favorite tank, which is warmed only by the sun. At times when I am most robust and when there is not a flaw in my bodily processes, I have very little energy left for bathing. After the bath, some stale bread and breakfast without a table, no need to wash the hands after such a meal. Then comes a very short nap. You know my habit. I avail myself of a scanty bit of sleep, unharnessing as it were, for I am satisfied if I can just stop staying awake. Sometimes I know that I have slept, at other times I have a mere suspicion. Lo, now the din of the races sounds about me. My ears are smitten with sudden and general cheering, but this does not upset my thoughts or even break their continuity. I can endure an uproar with complete resignation. The medley of voices blended in one note sounds to me like the dashing of waves, or like the wind that lashes the treetops, or like any other sound which conveys no meaning. What is it then, you ask, to which I have been giving my attention? I will tell you a thought sticks in my mind left over from yesterday, namely, what men of the greatest sagacity have meant when they have offered the most trifling and intricate proofs for problems of the greatest importance, proofs which may be true, but nonetheless resemble fallacies. Zeno, that greatest of men, the revered founder of our brave and holy school of philosophy, wishes to discourage us from drunkenness. Listen then to his arguments proving that the good man will not get drunk. No one entrusts a secret to a drunken man, but one will entrust a secret to a good man, therefore the good man will not get drunk. How ridiculous Zeno is made when we set up a similar syllogism in contrast with his. There are many, but one will be enough. No one entrusts a secret to a man when he is asleep, but one entrusts a secret to a good man, therefore the good man does not go to sleep. Posidonius pleads the cause of our master Zeno in the only possible way, but it cannot, I hold, be pleaded even in this way. For Posidonius maintains that the word drunken is used in two ways. In the one case of a man who is loaded with wine and has no control over himself, in the other of a man who is accustomed to get drunk and is a slave to the habit. Zeno, he says, meant the latter. The man who is accustomed to get drunk, not the man who is drunk, and no one would entrust to this person any secret, for it might be blabbed out when the man was in his cups. This is a fallacy. For the first syllogism refers to him who is actually drunk and not to him who is about to get drunk. You will surely admit that there is a great difference between a man who is drunk and a drunkard. He who is actually drunk may be in this state for the first time and may not have the habit, while the drunkard is often free from drunkenness. I therefore interpret the word in its usual meaning, especially since the syllogism is set up by a man who makes a business of the careful use of words and who weighs his language. Moreover, if this is what Zeno meant and what he wished it to mean to us, he was trying to avail himself of an equivocal word in order to work in a fallacy, and no man ought to do this when truth is the object of inquiry. But let us admit indeed that he meant what Posidonius says, even so, the conclusion is false, that secrets are not entrusted to an habitual drunkard. Think how many soldiers who are not always sober have been entrusted by a general or a captain or a centurion with messages which might not be divulged. With regard to the notorious plot to murder Gaius Caesar, I mean the Caesar who conquered Pompey and got control of the state, Tilius Cimber was trusted with it no less than Gaius Cassius. Now Cassius throughout his life drank water, while Tilius Simba was a sot as well as a brawler. Simba himself alluded to this fact, saying, I carry a master, I cannot carry my liquor. So let each one call to mind those who to his knowledge can be ill-trusted with wine, but well-trusted with the spoken word. And yet one case occurs to my mind which I shall relate, 
lest it fall into oblivion. For life should be provided with conspicuous illustrations. Let us not always be harking back to the dim past. Lucius Piso, the director of public safety at Rome, was drunk from the very time of his appointment. He used to spend the greater part of the night at banquets and would sleep until noon. That was the way he spent his morning hours. Nevertheless, he applied himself most diligently to his official duties, which included the guardianship of the city. Even the sainted Augustus trusted him with secret orders when he placed him in command of Thrace. Piso conquered that country. Tiberius too trusted him when he took his holiday in Campania, leaving behind him in the city many a critical matter that aroused both suspicion and hatred. I fancy that it was because Piso's drunkenness turned out well for the emperor that he appointed to the office of city prefect Cossus, a man of authority and balance, but so soaked and steeped in drink that once, at a meeting of the Senate, whither he had come after banqueting, he was overcome by a slumber from which he could not be roused, and had to be carried home. It was to this man that Tiberius sent many orders, written in his own hand, orders which he believed he ought not to trust even to the officials of his household. Cossus never let a single secret slip out, whether personal or public, so let us abolish all such harangues as this. No man in the bonds of drunkenness has power over his soul, as the very vats are burst by new wine, and as the dregs at the bottom are raised to the surface by the strength of the fermentation. So when the wine effervesces, whatever lies hidden below is brought up and made visible. As a man overcome by liquor cannot keep down his food when he has overindulged in wine, so he cannot keep back a secret either. He pours forth impartially both his own secrets and those of other persons. This of course is what commonly happens, but so does this, that we take counsel on serious subjects with those whom we know to be in the habit of drinking freely. Therefore this proposition, which is laid down in the guise of a defense of Zeno's syllogism is false, that secrets are not entrusted to the habitual drunkard. How much better it is to arraign drunkenness frankly and to expose its vices. For even the middling good man avoids them, not to mention the perfect sage, who is satisfied with slaking his thirst. The sage, even if now and then he is led on by good cheer, which for a friend's sake is carried somewhat too far, yet always stops short of drunkenness. We shall investigate later the question whether the mind of the sage is upset by too much wine and commits follies like those of the toper. But meanwhile, if you wish to prove that a good man ought not to get drunk, why work it out by logic? Show how base it is to pour down more liquor than one can carry, and not to know the capacity of one's own stomach. Show how often the drunkard does things which make him blush when he is sober. State that drunkenness sir, is nothing but a condition of insanity purposely assumed. Prolong the drunkard's condition to several days, will you have any doubt about his madness? Even as it is, the madness is no less, it merely lasts a shorter time. Think of Alexander of Macedon, who stabbed Cletus, his dearest and most loyal friend, at a banquet. After Alexander understood what he had done, he wished to die, and assuredly, he ought to have died. Drunkenness kindles and discloses every kind of vice, and removes the sense of shame that veils our evil undertakings. For more men abstain from forbidden actions because they are ashamed of sinning than because their inclinations are good. When the strength of wine has become too great and has gained control over the mind, every lurking evil comes forth from its hiding place. Drunkenness doesn't create vice, it merely brings it into view. At such times the lustful man does not wait even for the privacy of a bedroom, but without postponement gives free play to the demands of his passions. At such times the unchaste man proclaims and publishes his malady. At such times your cross-grained fellow does not restrain his tongue or his hand. The haughty man increases his arrogance, the ruthless man his cruelty, the slanderer his spitefulness. Every vice is given free play and comes to the front. Besides, we forget who we are. We utter words that are halting and poorly enunciated. The glance is unsteady, the step falters, the head is dizzy. The very ceiling moves about as if a cyclone were whirling the whole house, and the stomach suffers torture when the wine generates gas and causes our very bowels to swell. However, at the time, these troubles can be endured, so long as the man retains his natural strength. 
But what can he do when sleep impairs his powers and when that which was drunkenness becomes indigestion? Think of the calamities caused by drunkenness in a nation. This evil has betrayed to their enemies the most spirited and warlike races. This evil has made breaches in walls defended by the stubborn warfare of many years. This evil has forced under alien sway peoples who were utterly unyielding and defiant of the yoke. This evil has conquered by the wine cup those who in the field were invincible. Alexander, whom I have just mentioned, passed through his many marches, his many battles, his many winter campaigns, through which he worked his way by overcoming disadvantages of time or place, the many rivers which flowed from unknown sources, and the many seas, all in safety. It was intemperance in drinking that laid him low, and the famous death-dealing bowl of Hercules. What glory is there in carrying much liquor? When you have won the prize, and the other banqueters, sprawling asleep or vomiting, have declined your challenge to still other toasts. When you are the last survivor of the revels, when you have vanquished everyone by your magnificent show of prowess, and there is no man who has proved himself of so great capacity as you, you are vanquished by the cask. Mark Antony was a great man, a man of distinguished ability. But what ruined him and drove him into foreign habits and un-Roman vices? if it was not drunkenness and no less potent than wine love of Cleopatra. This it was that made him an enemy of the state. This it was that rendered him no match for his enemies. This it was that made him cruel when as he sat at table, the heads of the leaders of the state were brought in, when amid the most elaborate feasts and royal luxury, he would identify the faces and hands of men whom he had proscribed, a when, though heavy with wine, he yet thirsted for blood. It was intolerable that he was getting drunk while he did such things. How much more intolerable that he did these things while actually drunk. Cruelty usually follows wine-bibbing, for a man's soundness of mind is corrupted and made savage. Just as a lingering illness makes men querulous and irritable and drives them wild at the least crossing of their desires, so continued bouts of drunkenness bestialize the soul. For when people are often beside themselves, the habit of madness lasts on, and the vices which liquor generated retain their power even when the liquor is gone. Therefore you should state why the wise man ought not to get drunk. Explain by facts and not by mere words the hideousness of the thing and its haunting evils. Do that which is easiest of all. Demonstrate that what men call pleasures are punishments as soon as they have exceeded due bounds. For if you try to prove that the wise man can souse himself with much wine, and yet keep his course straight, even though he be in his cups. You may go on to infer by syllogisms that he will not die if he swallows poison, that he will not sleep if he takes a sleeping potion, that he will not vomit and reject the matter which clogs his stomach when you give him hell a bore. But when a man's feet totter and his tongue is unsteady, what reason have you for believing that he is half sober and half drunk? Letter 92 on the happy life. You and I will agree, I think, that outward things are sought for the satisfaction of the body, that the body is cherished out of regard for the soul, and that in the soul there are certain parts which minister to us, enabling us to move and to sustain life, bestowed upon us just for the sake of the primary part of us. In this primary part, there is something irrational and something rational. The former obeys the latter, while the latter is the only thing that is not referred back to another, but rather refers all things to itself. For the divine reason also is set in supreme command over all things, and is itself subject to none. And even this reason which we possess is the same, because it is derived from the divine reason. Now if we are agreed on this point, it is natural that we shall be agreed on the following also, namely, that the happy life depends upon this and this alone our attainment of perfect reason. For it is naught but this that keeps the soul from being bowed down, that stands its ground against fortune. Whatever the condition of their affairs may be, it keeps men untroubled. And that alone is a good which is never subject to impairment. That man, I declare, is happy whom nothing makes less strong than he is. He keeps to the heights, leaning upon none but himself. For one who sustains himself by any prop may fall. 
If the case is otherwise, then things which do not pertain to us will begin to have great influence over us. But who desires fortune to have the upper hand, or what sensible man prides himself upon that which is not his own? What is the happy life? It is peace of mind and lasting tranquility. This will be yours if you possess greatness of soul. It will be yours if you possess the steadfastness that resolutely clings to a good judgment just reached. How does a man reach this condition? By gaining a complete view of truth, by maintaining in all that he does, order, measure, fitness, and a will that is inoffensive and kindly, that is intent upon reason and never departs therefrom, that commands at the same time love and admiration. In short, to give you the principle in brief compass, the wise man's soul ought to be such as would be proper for a god. What more can one desire who possesses all honorable things? For if dishonorable things can contribute to the best estate, then there will be the possibility of a happy life under conditions which do not include an honorable life. And what is more base or foolish than to connect the good of a rational soul with things irrational? Yet there are certain philosophers who hold that the supreme good admits of increase because it is hardly complete when the gifts of fortune are adverse. Even Antipata, one of the great leaders of this school, admits that he ascribes some influence to externals, though only a very slight influence. You see, however, what absurdity lies in not being content with the daylight unless it is increased by a tiny fire. What importance can a spark have in the midst of this clear sunlight? If you are not contented with only that which is honorable, it must follow that you desire in addition either the kind of quiet which the Greeks call undisturbedness, or else pleasure. But the former may be attained in any case, for the mind is free from disturbance when it is fully free to contemplate the universe, and nothing distracts it from the contemplation of nature. The second pleasure is simply the good of cattle. We are but adding the irrational to the rational, the dishonorable to the honorable. A pleasant physical sensation affects this life of ours. Why, therefore, do you hesitate to say that all is well with a man just because all is well with his appetite? And do you rate, I will not say among heroes, but among men, the person whose supreme good is a matter of flavors and colors and sounds? Nay, let him withdraw from the ranks of this, the noblest class of living beings, second only to the gods. Let him herd with the dumb brutes, an animal whose delight is in fodder. The irrational part of the soul is twofold. The one part is spirited, ambitious, uncontrolled. Its seat is in the passions. The other is lowly, sluggish, and devoted to pleasure. Philosophers have neglected the former, which, though unbridled, is yet better, and is certainly more courageous and more worthy of a man, and have regarded the latter, which is nerveless and ignoble, as indispensable to the happy life. They have ordered reason to serve this latter. They have made the supreme good of the noblest living being an abject and mean affair, and a monstrous hybrid, too, composed of various members which harmonize but ill. For as our Virgil describing Scylla says, above, a human face and maiden's breast, a beauteous breast, below, a monster huge of bulk and shapeless, with a dolphin's tail joined to a wolf-like belly. And yet to this Scylla are tacked on the forms of wild animals, dreadful and swift, but from what monstrous shapes have these wise acres compounded wisdom? Man's primary art is virtue itself. There is joined to this the useless and fleeting flesh, fitted only for the reception of food, as Posidonius remarks. This divine virtue ends in foulness, and to the higher parts, which are worshipful and heavenly, there is fastened a sluggish and flabby animal. As for the second desideratum, quiet, although it would indeed not of itself be of any benefit to the soul, yet it would relieve the soul of hindrances. Pleasure, on the contrary, actually destroys the soul and softens all its vigor. What elements so inharmonious as these can be found united? To that which is most vigorous is joined that which is most sluggish, to that which is austere, that which is far from serious, to that which is most holy, that which is unrestrained, even to the point of impurity. What then, comes the retort, if good health, rest, and freedom from pain, are not likely to hinder virtue. Shall you not seek all these? Of course I shall seek them, but not because they are goods. I shall seek them because they are according to nature and because they will be acquired through the exercise of good judgment on my part. What then will be good in them, 
this alone, that it is a good thing to choose them. For when I don suitable attire, or walk as I should, or dine as I ought to dine, it is not my dinner, or my walk, or my dress that are goods, but the deliberate choice which I show in regard to them, as I observe, in each thing I do, a mean that conforms with reason. Let me also add that the choice of neat clothing is a fitting object of a man's efforts, for man is by nature a neat and well-groomed animal. Hence the choice of neat attire and not neat attire in itself is a good, since the good is not in the thing selected, but in the quality of the selection. Our actions are honorable, but not the actual things which we do. And you may assume that what I have said about dress applies also to the body. For nature has surrounded our soul with the body as with a sort of garment, the body is its cloak. But who has ever reckoned the value of clothes by the wardrobe which contained them? The scabbard does not make the sword good or bad, therefore with regard to the body, I shall return the same answer to you, that if I have the choice, I shall choose health and strength, but that the good involved will be my judgment regarding these things, and not the things themselves. Another retort is, Granted that the wise man is happy, nevertheless he does not attain the supreme good which we have defined, unless the means also which nature provides for its attainment are at his call. So, while one who possesses virtue cannot be unhappy, yet one cannot be perfectly happy if one lacks such natural gifts as health or soundness of limb. But in saying this, you grant the alternative which seems the more difficult to believe, that the man who is in the midst of unremitting and extreme pain is not wretched, nay, is even happy. And you deny that which is much less serious, that he is completely happy. And yet, if virtue can keep a man from being wretched, it will be an easier task for it to render him completely happy. For the difference between happiness and complete happiness is less than that between wretchedness and happiness. Can it be possible that a thing which is so powerful as to snatch a man from disaster and place him among the happy cannot also accomplish what remains and render him supremely happy? Does its strength fail at the very top of the climb? There are in life things which are advantageous and disadvantageous, both beyond our control. If a good man, in spite of being weighed down by all kinds of disadvantages, is not wretched, how is he not supremely happy? no matter if he does lack certain advantages, for as he is not weighted down to wretchedness by his burden of disadvantages, so he is not withdrawn from supreme happiness through lack of any advantages. Nay, he is just as supremely happy without the advantages as he is free from wretchedness, though under the load of his disadvantages. Otherwise, if his good can be impaired, it can be snatched from him altogether. A short space above, I remark that a tiny fire does not add to the sun's light, for by reason of the sun's brightness, any light that shines apart from the sunlight is blotted out. But, one may say, there are certain objects that stand in the way even of the sunlight. The sun, however, is unimpaired even in the midst of obstacles, and though an object may intervene and cut off our view thereof, the sun sticks to his work and goes on his course. Whenever he shines forth from amid the clouds, he is no smaller, nor less punctual either than when he is free from clouds, since it makes a great deal of difference whether there is merely something in the way of his light or something which interferes with his shining. Similarly, obstacles take nothing away from virtue. It is no smaller, but merely shines with less brilliancy. In our eyes it may perhaps be less visible and less luminous than before, but as regards itself, it is the same, and like the sun when he is eclipsed, is still, though in secret, putting forth its strength. Disasters, therefore, and losses and wrongs have only the same power over virtue that a cloud has over the sun. We meet with one person who maintains that a wise man who has met with bodily misfortune is neither wretched nor happy. But he also is in error, for he is putting the results of chance upon a parity with the virtues and is attributing only the same influence to things that are honorable as to things that are devoid of honor. But what is more detestable and more unworthy than to put contemptible things in the same class with things worthy of reverence? For reverence is due to justice, duty, loyalty, bravery, and prudence. On the contrary, those attributes are worthless, with which the most worthless men are often blessed in fuller measure, 
such as a sturdy leg, strong shoulders, good teeth, and healthy and solid muscles. Again, if the wise man whose body is a trial to him shall be regarded as neither wretched nor happy, but shall be left in a sort of halfway position, his life also will be neither desirable nor undesirable. But what is so foolish as to say that the wise man's life is not desirable? And what is so far beyond the bounds of credence as the opinion that any life is neither desirable nor undesirable? Again, if bodily ills do not make a man wretched, they consequently allow him to be happy. For things which have no power to change his condition for the worse have not the power either to disturb that condition when it is at its best. But someone will say, we know what is cold and what is hot. A lukewarm temperature lies between. Similarly, A is happy and B is wretched and C is neither happy nor wretched. I wish to examine this figure, which is brought into play against us. If I add to your lukewarm water a larger quantity of cold water, the result will be cold water. But if I pour in a larger quantity of hot water, the water will finally become hot. In the case, however, of your man who is neither wretched nor happy, no matter how much I add to his troubles, he will not be unhappy, according to your argument. Hence your figure offers no analogy. Again, suppose that I set before you a man who is neither miserable nor happy. I add blindness to his misfortunes. He is not rendered unhappy. I cripple him. He is not rendered unhappy. I add afflictions which are unceasing and severe. He is not rendered unhappy. Therefore, one whose life is not changed to misery by all these ills is not dragged by them either from his life of happiness. Then if, as you say, the wise man cannot fall from happiness to wretchedness, he cannot fall into non-happiness. For how, if one has begun to slip, can one stop at any particular place? That which prevents him from rolling to the bottom keeps him at the summit. Why, you urge, may not a happy life possibly be destroyed? It cannot even be disjointed, and for that reason virtue is itself of itself sufficient for the happy life. But, it is said, is not the wise man happier if he has lived longer and has been distracted by no pain than one who has always been compelled to grapple with evil fortune? Answer me now, is he any better or more honorable? If he is not, then he is not happier either. In order to live more happily, he must live more rightly. If he cannot do that, then he cannot live more happily either. Virtue cannot be strained tighter and therefore neither can the happy life which depends on virtue. For virtue is so great a good that it is not affected by such insignificant assaults upon it as shortness of life, pain, and the various bodily vexations. For pleasure does not deserve that. Virtue should even glance at it. Now what is the chief thing in virtue? It is the quality of not needing a single day beyond the present and of not reckoning up the days that are ours. In the slightest possible moment of time virtue completes an eternity of good. These goods seem to us incredible and transcending man's nature, for we measure its grandeur by the standard of our own weakness, and we call our vices by the name of virtue. Furthermore, does it not seem just as incredible that any man in the midst of extreme suffering should say, I am happy? And yet this utterance was heard in the very factory of pleasure, when Epicurus said, Today and one other day have been the happiest of all. Although in the one case he was tortured by strangury, and in the other by the incurable pain of an ulcerated stomach. Why then should those goods which virtue bestows be incredible in the sight of us, who cultivate virtue, when they are found even in those who acknowledge pleasure as their mistress? These also, ignoble and base-minded as they are, declare that even in the midst of excessive pain and misfortune, the wise man will be neither wretched nor happy. And yet this also is incredible, nay, still more incredible, than the other case. For I do not understand how, if virtue falls from her heights, she can help being hurled all the way to the bottom. She either must preserve one in happiness, or if driven from this position, she will not prevent us from becoming unhappy. If virtue only stands her ground, she cannot be driven from the field. She must either conquer or be conquered. But some say, only to the immortal gods is given virtue and the happy life. We can attain but the shadow, as it were, and semblance of such goods as theirs. We approach them, but we never reach them. Reason, however, is a common attribute of both gods and men. 
In the gods it is already perfected, in us it is capable of being perfected. But it is our vices that bring us to despair, for the second class of rational being man is of an inferior order, a guardian as it were, who is too unstable to hold fast to what is best, his judgment still wavering and uncertain. He may require the faculties of sight and hearing, good health, a bodily exterior that is not loathsome, and besides greater length of days conjoined with an unimpaired constitution. Though by means of reason he can lead a life which will not bring regrets, yet there resides in this imperfect creature, man, a certain power that makes for badness, because he possesses a mind which is easily moved to perversity. Suppose, however, the badness which is in full view and has previously been stirred to activity to be removed. The man is still not a good man, but he is being molded to goodness. One, however, in whom there is lacking any quality that makes for goodness is bad. But he in whose body virtue dwells and spirit air present is equal to the gods. Mindful of his origin, he strives to return thither. No man does wrong in attempting to regain the heights from which he once came down. And why should you not believe that something of divinity exists in one who is a part of God? All this universe which encompasses us is one and it is God. We are associates of God, we are his members. Our soul has capabilities and is carried thither if vices do not hold it down. Just as it is the nature of our bodies to stand erect and look upward to the sky, so the soul, which may reach out as far as it will, was framed by nature to this end, that it should desire equality with the gods. And if it makes use of its powers and stretches upward into its proper region, it is by no alien path that it struggles toward the heights. It would be a great task to journey heavenwards, the soul but returns thither. When once it has found the road, it boldly marches on, scornful of all things. It casts no backward glance at wealth, gold and silver, things which are fully worthy of the gloom in which they once lay. It values not by the sheen which smites the eyes of the ignorant, but by the mire of ancient days, whence our greed first detached and dug them out. The soul, I affirm, knows that riches are stored elsewhere than in men's heaped-up treasure houses, that it is the soul and not the strong box which should be filled. It is the soul that men may set in dominion over all things and may install as owner of the universe, so that it may limit its riches only by the boundaries of east and west, and like the gods may possess all things, and that it may, with its own vast resources, look down from on high upon the wealthy, no one of whom rejoices as much in his own wealth as he resents the wealth of another. When the soul has transported itself to this lofty height, it regards the body also, since it is a burden which must be borne, not as a thing to love, but as a thing to oversee, nor is it subservient to that over which it is set in mastery, for no man is free who is a slave to his body. Indeed, omitting all the other masters which are brought into being by excessive care for the body, the sway which the body itself exercises is captious and fastidious. Forth from this body the soul issues, now with unruffled spirit, now with exaltation, and when once it has gone forth, asks not what shall be the end of the deserted day. No, just as we do not take thought for the clippings of the hair and the beard, even so that divine soul, when it is about to issue forth from the mortal man, regards the destination of its earthly vessel, whether it be consumed by fire, or shut in by a stone, or buried in the earth, or torn by wild beasts, as being of no more concern to itself than is the afterbirth to a child just born. And whether this body shall be cast out and plucked to pieces by birds, or devoured when thrown to the sea dogs as prey, how does that concern him who is nothing? Nay, even when it is among the living, the soul fears nothing that may happen to the body after death. For though such things may have been threats, they were not enough to terrify the soul previous to the moment of death. It says, I am not frightened by the executioner's hook, nor by the revolting mutilation of the corpse which is exposed to the scorn of those who would witness the spectacle. I ask no man to perform the last rites for me. I entrust my remains to none. Nature has made provision that none shall go unburied. Time will lay away one whom cruelty has cast forth. Those were eloquent words which Messinus uttered. I want no tomb, 
for nature doth provide for outcast bodies burial. You would imagine that this was the saying of a man of strict principles. He was indeed a man of noble and robust native gifts, but in prosperity he impaired these gifts by laxness. Farewell. As we reach the end of this enlightening exploration into Seneca's Stoic principles, it's clear that each of these hand-picked letters serves as a unique lens through which we can examine the complexities of human emotions and the quest for authentic joy. Today, we've traveled far and wide across the rich landscape of Stoic philosophy, extending the foundational insights we gleaned from our previous video and diving even deeper into how these age-old teachings can offer us unmatched emotional resilience in today's fast-paced world. The guiding principle that ties all these letters together is the Stoic focus on internal over external, a pivot toward our inner selves to find the stability, contentment, and emotional resilience that the outside world cannot provide. By seeking seclusion for self-reflection, as mentioned in the first letter, we arm ourselves with the mental clarity needed to tackle life's many complexities. This self-imposed solitude serves not as an escape, but as a strategy for understanding the essence of our desires and aspirations. Moving from seclusion to joy, we delved into the unspoken truth that joy is an internal condition, irrespective of external circumstances. The elusive sense of happiness we constantly seek in material goods, societal status or others' approval is within us all along. The key is to understand that joy is not something to be found, it's something to be cultivated and maintained, and it begins with a shift in perspective, a shift in values. The third letter enriched our understanding of the concept of retirement not the end of life retreat into oblivion, but the stoic practice of retreating from the chaos to focus on the essentials. It's about momentarily stepping back to realign our life's compass, to breathe, think, and then re-engage with the world from a place of renewed strength and wisdom. Discussing the subject of drunkenness and excess in the fourth letter, we confronted the darker aspects of human behavior that everyone to some degree has grappled with. Whether it's overindulging in food, drink, or even emotional extremes, Seneca reminds us that the goal should always be moderation, self-control, and inner harmony. And finally, we touch the apex of human pursuit, the quest for a happy life. This is not a transient emotional state, but a lasting condition of well-being, rooted in ethical living, mindfulness, and a genuine understanding of our place in the cosmic order. It's as if each letter serves as a stepping stone, helping us cross the turbulent river of existence towards a state of invulnerable joy and emotional equilibrium. The stoic truths in these letters serve not just as philosophical ideas to ponder, but as actionable insights to apply here and now. So here's my call to action for you. Take just one of these principles, whether it's the strategy of seclusion for self-reflection, the internal cultivation of joy, the wisdom of tactical withdrawal, the mastery of self-control, or the pursuit of genuine happiness, and apply it consciously for the next week. Make a daily habit of it, and then take a moment to observe how it transforms your emotional landscape. Allow Seneca's wisdom to not just enter your mind, but to permeate your life. It's one thing to be moved emotionally by philosophy, but it's another to be transformed by it. And that's the challenge I leave you with today. Don't just be a passive receiver of wisdom, be an active participant in your own transformation. The journey toward emotional mastery and genuine joy is not a spectator sport, it's the very essence of life. <laughs>